I prepared some slides as an introduction. So what is BLIS? BLIS stands for Beamline Instrumentation Support Software. And it's a software project uh, from ESRF that has been started uh, during the, um, the ESRF upgrade. So um, it was part of the, the, the update program. So I'm sure you already heard about the EBS. So this is this, uh, this program that gives us uh, the, the new uh, fourth generation light source, uh, the new beam. So it has been a 150 million euro investment and it's ending uh, this year. In fact, I mean the investment. Uh, and we, uh, we are uh, building new beam lines. Uh, we already built some here you know, that you have probably visited already, but new ones are being built. And uh, there is a whole strategy for data as a service and improving our software uh, as well as the, the whole ESRF in fact. So um, if we want to have a little overview of this, I can tell you about the project goals. So the BLIS project goals um, is to have state-of-the-art beamline control, which means uh, the best scans we can do with the beamline hardware, uh, continuous scans, trajectories, and also having real data management, which is very important. And we will uh, talk about that at the end of this uh, tutorial. Um, also, one of our objectives was, was to have an integrated environment with the command line interface for you to be able to interact with the devices on the beamline, but also a nice tool for the configuration. Well, this is more for, let's say, beamline scientists. Uh, you as users, normally you won't configure this too much, but you never know. And to have live data display. So this is very important for you to be able to visualize uh, what's going on during the acquisition and to be ready for new challenges. So um, with, uh, our goals are for extensibility, so it means that with Bliss, we want to be ready for the next 10 years or more, not uh, only uh, a short uh, period, we want it, the system to be uh, really extendable. Um, to have uh, user sequences not be limited by, uh, the, by the, the software for writing advanced user sequences, and even to have more advanced algorithms for to treat data or to do the data acquisition, in fact. For example, to bring some artificial intelligence in the way how to, I don't know, collect data, but this is, a, this is for the future, but okay, we, we want to be ready for all those challenges. And so if we want to have a little overview of the system, this is um, how it looks like. So I took a poster we made for a conference uh, in China recently, a remote one, of course. So um, this is an integrated environment and it covers itself a wide range of beamline control needs. So what is important to notice is that it's written in Python. So some of you already know Python, some of you don't. Um, Python, Python is, a, is a very uh, useful language uh, in the scientific community, very uh, widespread. So uh, if you don't know it, I think you will learn at some point in any way. And um, voila, this allows to really uh, write the sequences you want for data acquisition. And this is the goal of this tutorial to show you a bit how it works and, and, and the BLISH shell and everything. So I'm not going to talk about all those different things individually because uh, we will so, so see this in the tutorial. But uh, maybe what interests you is to know which ESRF beamlines today have BLISS and, and, and uh, because we are making the transition from the previous system to the new system. So today we are 24 on stations, so approximately half, half of, of the of the stations that are that are already running Bliss, and the full deployment is is for next year in fact. So we can see here where Bliss is installed already. So some beamlines have different have multiple end stations. So this is why you don't see uh, 24 here, but voila. And in fact, there are more CRG beamlines. I forgot to put in this, uh, in this slide. So, um, stop sharing now. Um, see. Okay, so um, I, I will now uh, present a bit the speakers to, of this afternoon. So we have um, Valentin who is next to me. I don't know if you can see him. In fact, as you can see his hand probably. <laughs> So Valentin is going to, is going to talk about data visualization, and we have Vout, which is going to talk about data saving and accessing data in general. So I don't know if you, if you can hear or see Vout. 
probably. Well, uh, you can see him uh, raising a uh, raising hand. Okay. Um, okay, great. So, in order to have a fluid tutorial, I would like to ask you when you have questions to use the chat. So, don't feel free to write your question, and we will answer it. So, we'll have uh, breaks. So, with the with the breaks, we will be able to answer your questions, or at appropriate moments. It depends the amount of questions. So, feel free to write, and we will answer you. And let's see if we can work like that. So. This afternoon, we'll show you how to get ready with our software, and we will walk through some of the features of Bliss, not all, of course, and hopefully, uh, you will have a good understanding of Bliss in the next hours. Um, and the nice thing for this tutorial, you will have the opportunity to try the system yourself, uh, because the, thanks to the SRF computing team, we have put in place some virtual computers with a pre-installed uh, Bliss. So, okay, this is for later, but. So, okay, I said that Bliss is based on Python and that uh, it's uh, replacing uh, the previous software used at ESRF, which was uh, called Spec. And uh, so it's a terminal-based application. So on most beam lines, when you, get, uh, when you get in, the only thing you see about the system is a black window with a prompt to type the command. <laughs> so I will, um, I will show you maybe, okay. So, um, uh, you have to share your screen, Matthias. Yes, I think because we, you don't see the screen anymore, so I'm going to share this immediately. Thanks, Valens. So here it is. So basically, when you come to a beam line, you see this terminal window or something uh, like that, and you can type your commands in. Uh, voila, nothing uh, fancy, but the fancy comes afterwards. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so okay. So we, we in the tutorial we will use what we call the demo session. So the demo session is a, a demonstration uh, session we we have we built we made uh, with the the objects we use for doing our own tests of this in fact. But when you come to a Beamline, normally the sessions you have to use, they are already configured by the Beamline scientists and, and uh, local contacts. So you, you are not supposed to make a new one from scratch. So you, you will always start with something. And so in this uh, this shell, uh, which is based on the PT Python, so it's a, it's a software uh, that is similar to IPython for those who know. Uh, but you can type, you have a real uh, Python interpreter, so you can type Python commands directly. So, for example, um, you can do some basic calculation, for example. If you type a 1 plus 1, you get 2 when you press enter. And uh, the, similarly, you can define uh, variables. So, for example, you can say A equals 42, for example. And then you have some predefined commands that are already loaded like the print command. So uh, it's a function, in fact. So like a bit like mathematical functions for those who have never used Python or any uh, computer programming language. Basically, print uh, is one of the commands that are that is available in the shell. So you can do print, then you put the parenthesis and you put A, for example, it will print 42. And you can also print uh, characters like, uh, for example, hello. And like this, you, 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 you can execute functions and see the results uh, in the shell. So the shell, in fact, is what we call a read eval print loop. So it, because it's reading what we type on the, on the keyboard, it's evaluating, printing the result, and it loops. Um, so basically, this is the, the way to, to, to communicate with the shell. And so you can create your own functions. So, for example, this is with the def keyword. So here we are not going to just a little note. We are not going to um, learn Python. I mean, I'm, we just show you uh, very basic stuff. So then you, you can see how to interact with the shell. But I, OK, I tell you how to define functions and how the shell behaves. So uh, to define new functions, uh, you can use the def keyword. So you can do def space, and then you give a name for the for the function. So for example, I will uh, I will um, add the function sum of two, uh, and then I can give some input to the function. So I will uh, put the a and b. 
So those are the names um, that will be uh, assigned to the values that will be passed by the user to execute the fun when it, the function will be executed. So for example, if I do this uh, sum of two function, uh, I do A plus B and I use the keyword return to tell the return the results of the function in fact. So if I do this, I'm adding to the global namespace where all the functions are and the variables are, I'm adding my own sum of two function. Uh, it comes along with print or others. So there is a nice feature in the shell that if you press the tab uh, key, you have completion. So for example, if I do print and then I, I can complete, complete with tab, I, it's completing the, the, the call. And, I, and the same with the function I just created, in fact, I can write sum and then it proposed me sum of two. So this is the function I want to call. And then I, uh, when I put the parenthesis, I'm, I, I see that it expects two arguments, A and B. So I'm going to put uh, one and three. And of course, I will get four as the result. So this is the this is just a normal Python interpreter. So you you just have to think about the this shell as a normal Python interpreter where you can type commands uh, in Python and, and execute functions. And of course, we added our own uh, functions. So um, I'm thinking, uh, okay. So we can do more complicated functions, and for example, uh, to to uh, to do one function to apply uh, uh, Pythagoras, for example, to return the length uh, of hypotenuse of a triangle or something. So let's let's make it uh, like that. Okay. So here I, I give the length of the two um, two uh, side of the triangle. And here I can put some comments to tell what my function is about. So for example, that we say, okay, this is applying uh, Pythagoras. I can write what, whatever string I want. Okay, for example, so this is a, let's, this is what is called the doc string. It's to document the function. And so um, when I press enter, as, as uh, the input is not finished because it doesn't form a complete function. Uh, in fact, I, I'm, I, I have this, uh, this uh, three dots here, which means that I, I, I'm in, in writing uh, the function in fact. So then I will return a square root of uh, S squared two like that. Okay. Uh, sorry. Well, so if I'm not wrong, it should be fine. So then I can I can indeed calculate. Uh, for example, I give one one, and I will get a square of two. Voila. Okay. And so some functions like uh, square root, for example, this is the square root function. They are just derived from NumPy, they are reported from NumPy. So NumPy is a very well-known and very useful uh, package for manipulating matrices and, and doing a lot of calculation in Python that, that probably most of you know already. But uh, so we have this uh, square root function, which is in fact uh, the, the, the function from NumPy. So we have in the this shell already some globals that are defined. And you may want to have so to want some help on the functions. So, for example, we will see soon uh, how to move motors, and the, the function to move motors is called MV. So, if you want, you can do okay the, the MV function. Okay, uh, uh, if I execute it, I don't know how it works. So, it, it, it says uh, I call MV, but I forgot to put any argument. So then, it, 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 I have this message when I see uh, the expected argument, and in fact, you can use the help to get more information about uh, what uh, about how to use the function. So all Python functions have help. So if I press help, then I see here uh, more explanation. So I see that I can give motor one position one, motor two position two, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the functions uh, the, the motors will move to the to the target position. So this is help. Something you may have noticed um, 
that, uh, I pressed, I, I wrote ND, and when I pressed enter, it put automatically the parenthesis. So in fact, we have something called the typing helper. So by default, the typing helper is on. And so the typing helper, it allows to write a command just like we were writing them in spec, for those who know spec, without putting parentheses or commas or whatever. And it's converting, visually you can see the, the difference, it's converting this into valid Python. Because in Python, you always have to put the parentheses, the comma. So for example, if I want to um, execute uh, my hypotenuse uh, function, I can write calculate here. So it's proposing me uh, via the, um, the completion, I can select calculate hypotenuse or callable. So I will uh, select uh, calculate hypotenuse, the first one. Uh, so I press tab, it's completing. And so now instead of putting the parenthesis, I will just press space and it's putting the parenthesis itself, the typing helper. So then you, you, you press space and you see the parenthesis. So I will do the same uh, calculation, I put one. Then I will also again press space and it will put the comma and I put one again. And finally I press enter, I'm not closing the parentheses and you will see that the parentheses gets closed and of course I get the same result. So the typing helper, it, it saves you some time when you type the commands. And for those who know spec, uh, it allows you to really type what you type in spec. So for example, in spec, it, I put uh, the, the hash to not execute the thing. You were typing this, for example, uh, move uh, TTH uh, somewhere, uh, move uh, TY uh, somewhere. And, and this, in fact, uh, you, you, you really type that. In normal Python, you have to type this. Voilà. So it's a bit more typing. So to save typing, in fact, the typing helper, uh, you write the first line with the spaces and it converts to the command and, and parentheses. Of course, some, sometimes there you might, I don't know, it, it, it's not a, let's say, a foolproof uh, solution because we have to do a lot of guesses to know if we have to put the comma, if we have to put the parentheses or whatever. So if you want to disable it, if it gets on your way or whatever, you press F7, and then in this case, it's disabled. So now if I press MV space, I have a space. But if I enable it by F7 again, if I press MV space, I have a parenthesis. So OK, this is the typing helper. I guess that when you will try this, you will find it useful, hopefully. So something else to know is that we based um, our terminal on something called Tmax. So Tmax is a Unix uh, software tool. In fact, it allows to uh, multiplex a terminal, which means that, for example, you have one running terminal and someone else can start the same process and joins you in a session. So it helps, for example, for local contacts uh, when they are home, for example, if you, they want to give some help on the beam line, uh, they can join the session. Of course, today we have more powerful tools for that, but I mean, if you want to stay uh, text-based, let's say, or very efficient in terms of network uh, bandwidth and everything, we have this feature of sharing the, the terminal uh, with different sessions. And, and so this is done via Tmax. We also use Tmax for other stuff, but I keep it for later. Um, so uh, because of Tmax, you have to know that when you want to copy paste, you have to press shift uh, when you want to copy. So for example, if I want, I want to copy this, 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 uh, this line here to calculate the hypotenuse, so I press shift, I select the text, and then I can, I can, I can, uh, uh, I can press, uh, the, uh, use the mouse to, to paste, or I can also uh, use the, the menu, uh, copy and paste. Uh, so this uh, depends on your terminal, okay? So the only thing to know is that when you want to copy, you press shift. And when you want to paste, it's like normal, in fact. So um, before we go to the, to the, let's say, some first practice with, the, with Bliss for, that you can do yourself uh, thanks to the virtual machines, I'm going to show you how you can write your own Python scripts uh, and this is called, uh, we have uh, functions, uh, it's called the user scripts. So let me, I will share the screen uh, with the documentation. Let me do that. Okay. 
So I'm looking for, for these parts in the documentation. Voila. Okay. Let me share this again. Okay, so okay, one thing to notice is that basically all we are gonna talk about today is already available in this documentation, okay? So um, there is the link, uh, uh, we, we will give you the links, but uh, in the slides, there is the link of, the, of the, this documentation. Uh, and from this documentation, you have a, a section called Bliss in a Nutshell. And what we're gonna talk today, basically, is all that is in Bliss in a Nutshell, in fact. So now I'm talking about user-defined sequences. So this is this part. And uh, you have additional training resources in this page as well. We have, for example, some video tutorials. So we have video tutorials about different subjects. And we, we made those videos during the first confinement uh, when we were a bit uh, home alone, let's say. Let's say. Um, so here, getting started with nutshell, user-defined sequencing. So this is the, the, what we added in uh, the Bliss shell to be able to load uh, user scripts. And uh, so user scripts means your functions. For example, your function for the night shift or when you want to repeat the same measurement on some different, on the same sample or different samples, you want to, to repeat some commands or whatever, you, you can write your own script and then you can execute the script. And what is interesting for those who know Python is that you, in this script, you can really use uh, all, all of Python that you know, it's not limited to anything. So um, I, I, there are two functions, in fact, user script load and user script run. So I'm going to demonstrate that. So for example, um, I'm going to create a new, um, a new script. I guess you see this. Uh, okay, I'm going to connect from here. So I'm connecting to my computer and I'm going to add a, a new script to this uh, and so I'm going to load it, and you will see that, okay? Okay, so this is my business. Uh, when I do this, then I have to go to my directory. Voila. Well, in fact, I can, I can be in any directory. So let's say, okay, I'm going to create a script in slash TNT. Yes. Sorry? Yes, we so. see we see your web browser. She's not sure. Hi, you you don't share it. I'm not not sharing it. Okay, I'm really sorry. Okay, I'm sharing it now. <laughs> okay, I'm really sorry. Um, voilà. So now you see this, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm gonna add the Python script I write myself somewhere uh, in the directory. So here it will be slash tmp. But on the beam lines, most probably. You will use your slash data visitor where you have your your experiment session. This is where you put your scripts, for example. So here I will make uh, my own script. So let's say uh, my script. Let's say. Voila. So this is my Python script. And so from here I can write my functions. So I will uh, I will make a little function that uh, prints a message. Uh, for example, I will call that say hello. And this uh, function will uh, return the hello string. Okay, I make something very basic to start with. Okay, and so this this uh, this script now I can I can I can load it uh, in the session. So from here I can do a user script load, and I can give the full path to the script. So you can you have to imagine that you put slash data visitor I mean where your script is on the on the on the nice directory at SRF, okay and so here uh, my script is called my script so you have completion so you can see um, you can more easily find your file this is it so what does this do is that it's uh, written a bit here it's exporting uh, a new uh, it's reading the script and it's exporting globals and functions into a user namespace by default. So you have user dot, and now I have my say hello function, okay? So I can call it here and I see hello. And in fact, I can also decide when I use the, so 
this is really the recommended way to, to uh, load scripts because it's putting the things into what is called the namespace. So the namespace is called user. So you know, if you, if you use your, the user script load function, you know that the thing will go into a user namespace. And it's good because it's not, um, let's say, uh, polluting or adding stuff in the global namespace of, of Bliss itself. But you can, you can also decide to uh, use another namespace if you want. So you can do, you can start, the, you can load the same script like that and say um, export global and you give a name, for example, my experiment. And like this, I'm creating, in fact, my experiment namespace where I have my functions inside. So, and you can load different scripts and put them in the same namespace. So this is a, a let's say, a way from the command line for you to write your Python scripts uh, as a separate file and then to, to load them and group them in a relevant namespace for your experiment. And um, the, the good thing is that all the objects or things that are defined in Bliss, they are available directly in the script. So for example, here we, we made those functions to calculate uh, hypotenuse, okay? So we can also change here uh, the script and say, for example, I will add a new function that calculates uh, something uh, and that it uh, can use uh, the previously defined function. So let's say uh, test function. Uh, and I will call from here, uh, calculate. I can't remember the name of it, but yeah. So yes, it was OK. And I will call it with different parameters, OK? And I return that. So what is important to, to notice is that in this script, you can use the objects that are already uh, defined in Bliss without uh, importing, because normally, normally in Python, we have to import stuff. But this is, a, let's say, a convenience uh, uh, way to do things uh, to, to, be, uh, to stay simple for simple scripts. And of course, those who know more advanced Python, they can, they can do more advanced stuff. But basically, I'm going to load again this, in fact. So now I have my, here I have my new function, uh, test function. And so if I call it, I get the result, um, uh, like we expect, in fact, uh, of this, through this function, because it, it goes finally to the same, uh, the functions are exported to this uh, my namespace. So it's a bit different from the way uh, uh, let's say uh, Python normally works. Still, it's completely compatible uh, with Python. So um, it's it's more like uh, to have um, the same behavior as we, we had before in spec, where people were able to load their scripts without worrying too much. So uh, this is a way. And of course, you have uh, more. Uh, you can here here it's just normal Python. So you can you can import uh, if you know something like the Python module, for example. You can there is a time module in Python. You, you can, for example, do something like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, a line uh, spectrometer or something. And then here you will do your stuff. And, and for example, uh, you can write, uh, OK, aligning. So you will, uh, you will execute uh, your code. So here we can say, OK, instead of aligning, I just sleep for one second. And then I can say, OK, done. So you can, you can write code like this. And then uh, this is normal Python. And so here you can, again, uh, uh, execute the user script load function. Uh, and so in the my exp here, I have my new function here. And so uh, it's, it's uh, executing the code, OK? So I'm looking now for. Uh, Okay, I'm looking now for the um, for the next part. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, so I think um, at this moment I don't know. We have maybe a question. I know. Okay, this is the so without put in the chat the link to the documentation so you can have a look and you can see from there uh, the same page I was showing with the with the documentation of this. Okay, so at this moment. Uh, I think it's good for you guys to try to connect to the virtual machines that have been put in place for this tutorial so you can uh, play yourself with this 
and then we continue with the with the tutorial so in order to do this i'm going to share my screen and you have to follow a bit what i'm doing so i'm going to show you okay wait a minute sharing the screen voila so the platform that has been put in place is called visa.csrf.fr so you can try this yourself and you will get access to a virtual computer with Bliss pre-installed. So then you can test the Bliss in fact. So you have to sign in with your user account. In my case, I'm already registered, so voila. And once you arrive here, you can create a new instance. So I will wait maybe a bit for people to be uh, more or less uh, all connected to this uh, website because if you want to to experiment with bliss uh, you have to use this I and mean, it's it's far easier because the other possibility would be to for you if you have a linux laptop you can install yourself bliss on your laptop it's very easy but still not all of you have linux laptops this is why we were asking the questions uh, beforehand so i think it's better if we can rely on those uh, virtual computers so you go to visa.csr.fr, you sign in with your uh, normal uh, single sign-on, and then you create a new instance. Um, so I'm going to press on it. And you will see search for experiments. So this is a new platform we are putting in place, OK? So here you can see user meetings, virtual. So there is only one choice. So you select, you close. And then you have Bliss here. So this is the Bliss virtual machine. You click on it. You click on, on the eight cores, uh, 16 gigabyte memory. So this will be the, the computer you will get. And you have nothing to, else to do. You accept terms and conditions and you create. And this is making a, a Bliss uh, virtual machine for you. And so then it's building, you have to wait for the build, but it's very fast, I think. It takes only uh, maybe a minute or something like that. So maybe it's a good moment uh, while people are doing that. If you have questions, maybe, I don't know, we can a bit answer your questions before we continue the tutorial, because it will be then up more up to you to test the things. So voila, I don't know if you have questions. It's okay not to have questions as well. <laughs> I mean, it's just a matter of that we are not losing anyone and that you, you are able to build your virtual computer as well. No? So, okay, so here I'm done with the building of this uh, virtual computer. So once it's done, I can click on connect. And so I will get uh, my virtual computer with this installed. So here, once you get, sorry. So once you, once you have your virtual computer running, you see this screen, so you press activities, and then you can, uh, you, can uh, have, you can run a lot of applications. So here we can run terminal. And I'm gonna, uh, okay. And once you are there, voila, once you are there, you can, um, you can execute, uh, you have a command to start the Bliss server. So this is the command, this is the command to use to, uh, to start the, the servers of Bliss, because uh, Bliss needs, okay, some servers to run, Ex especially the demo session, because we, we simulate some kind of hardware. So this is very uh, uh, important to start the server first. And once you have done that, you can start another process in the terminal as well. So I start another one. In fact, right. well, I, I, I put another tab. So I have this tab where I started the Bliss server and this tab, which is a new one. And here you can source Bliss. Um, this uh, and this is how is it called? This console. So you can source this console. And like this, you get the Bliss instance uh, for the demonstration, and you will be able to follow the rest of the tutorial. Voilà. And here I can write, you have the same uh, thing as I had before. And you can you can use your your new skills to try a bit on the terminal. 
So um, is everybody, uh, is there anyone that is struggling with that or is it fine? <laughs> okay, I have uh, maybe a question here. Um, so from Michele. Uh, means it's okay. Ah, it means it's okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe I do. Ah, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm reading the chat. So, okay, the first command, like Val says, is bliss minus server. In fact, it's a source bliss minus console, and then you get the prompt. Maybe everyone who has succeeded can go into the Zoom reactions and put a thumbs up so that we can kind of keep track. Okay. So this platform is brand new. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> In fact, there is no there is no uh, output. So Bliss server, in fact, uh, you you don't see any output. So maybe it's already ready. You just need to start another terminal and and do the command. So I think there is something to ask for support if you are stuck in your virtual machine. But uh, it's a brand new platform. So they they I'm very happy from our computing services. We put this in place for us because. Uh, it's something new developed at ILL, and uh, in the future, uh, the idea is that um, uh, ESRF users could uh, get some virtual computers to do some uh, computation, uh, data analysis. You will get a GPU. I mean, you will get a lot of uh, power behind all that. Yeah. But today is a bit the preview uh, of this technology, let's say. Okay, so what, what I think, what we can do now uh, is a little pause, a little break of uh, 15 minutes. So it lets time for people to try the thing, um, to try to put this in place. And uh, meanwhile, if you have problems, we are here to answer questions. And in 15 minutes, we start again, okay? So I will, just, I will stop video just uh, to indicate that we start again in 15 minutes. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we, are, we stay here for the chat, okay? We are going to show you how to interact uh, with Beamline hardware so um, for <clears throat> to be able to perform data acquisition. So I'm gonna share my screen. This is the demo session again. So basically, this is the same demo session as you get in the virtual machine. And um, I'm gonna, to talk about the motors. So the motors are one of the essential uh, part of uh, Bliss, just like it was already uh, before in spec. So we have commands like yeah, you may know already, WA. So WA is where all, it's the, it gives the position of all the motors in fact. So if I execute WA in this demo session, we have those motors in fact. And uh, uh, there is a sample stage here, in fact, uh, the S, S, Y, S, Z, it's the sample stage. And we have skids uh, and we have no, some other motors. Um, so as you can see, there are uh, two positions that are printed. Why? I'm going to show you. It's because there is user position and dial position. So we kept the same things as in spec, in fact. The dial position is the position from the controller, so it's the real, uh, I mean, it's the position that is read from the controller. Uh, it corresponds to what the controller thinks the position is, depending on the mechanical uh, mounting of the, of, the, of the device, in fact. And the user is uh, just um, uh, an offset and a sign that you can put, uh, uh, at, uh, that you can apply to the, to the dial position. 
So in fact, it's useful for you, for example, when you want to, to you, for example, you center a, a sample and you can say, okay, this position is zero, in fact. So you can say all the motors that are from the sample stage, now your, your position, in fact, is zero. And so it, this will apply an offset to the, to the real motors, uh, I mean, to the, to the real position, and there will be a difference between the user position and the dial position. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. So for example, I can uh, use the UMV updated move, UMV command, to move, um, for example, uh, uh, SX uh, to uh, position uh, one, let's say. So here I see it, okay. Um, it was a bit fast, so uh, I can change the speed and, and the acceleration of the motor. So let's do that. So at the moment, we have this acceleration value. Okay, it's a lot. So we'll reduce it a lot. And so now, fully, we will see it uh, moving more slowly, in fact. Voilà, a bit more slowly, but I can also uh, reduce the velocity. But we will check this uh, uh, later, in any ways. But just for you to know, so I can I can really reduce the speed uh, of all those motors. So then it's uh, it, it gives a well, not really. But anyways, so we have I, I should think about the parameters in any way. So we have this S6 motor which is at coordinate one, position one. It's both the same for user and dial. So it means that the the motor controller itself uh, thinks that the position is one. So okay, good. So now imagine that I have centered my sample or whatever. So then I can say, okay, uh, finally, uh, the position for A6 is zero. So I write it like that. And so like this, I'm changing, I'm assigning zero to the position of the motor and it has the effect of introducing an offset of minus one. So now if I do WM A6, I see a difference between the position from the from the hardware, which is still one, of course, because the motor didn't move in any way, and the position I see uh, as the user coordinates. So when you do your scans, uh, normally you have position in user coordinates, and it's also possible to get the dial position if needed. But normally, what is interesting for you is the user coordinate of the motor. So. Something we can see as well with the with this uh, WM command, which is where motor, is to to we get the the limits. So there is high and low limits. So those limits are software limits, uh, which means that it's uh, to normally it's used to protect uh, devices or to prevent from touching the hard limits. Uh, it's important to not touch hard limits because uh, hard limits are not very precise most of the time, except if it's a, a specially crafted uh, device that has a very precise hard limit, you can imagine whatever. But normally the hard limits are really there to prevent uh, collisions or to prevent, uh, to break uh, devices or motors or, or, or the equipment. And uh, the soft limits that are there to, to not touch the hard limits because if you touch the hard limit, uh, normally it's a switch and the motor will be uh, stopped uh, uh, almost immediately and there is a high chance that it will lose its position or, or stuff like that. Or So it's better to not touch our limits. So this is why we have software limits. So uh, this, this motor, I mean user coordinates. So when you move, you're always in user coordinates. We have also the, um, some other commands like NVD, move dial, but this is, uh, let's say, for advanced usage. So in your case, let's say we want to uh, move to uh, minus four. I can't go to minus four because the low limit of the axis now is minus three. Okay. So let's see. So I can do UMV. So I, I'm writing UMV, then space. It gives this parenthesis. So S6 space minus four. Okay, let's try. So then it says, no, you can't go to minus four because you would exceed the low limit of minus three. Okay, so then in this case, uh, okay, I, I can say, oh, it's a mistake. I will move to minus two, for example. In this case, it works. And at the end, I see that the dial, in fact, is minus one, but the user position is minus two where I want it to go. So the limits we can change. So, okay, I, if in fact this motor, for example, is uh, rotating, 
uh, I can, I, it's not a moving a linear stage or whatever. There is no real reason to have a limit or whatever. I can change limits. So I can, okay, limits, finally, I would say no, no limit. So you just do it like that. And now if you do WMSX, you should see my infinite and minus infinite. So the limits are, are really uh, applied. Uh, so those are software limits. So now I can move uh, to, um, to uh, much, uh, for example, I can use UMVR, which is updated move relative. So then it's the same as in spec, in fact, for those who know. So I can say, okay, uh, SX go to uh, 1000, for example. And now it will move 1000 from where it is. And you can see the move is going on. So those you can also type in your shell that you have uh, in, the, in the demo session, in your virtual machine. And I can even go to uh, much higher because there is no limit to these motors now, so okay. And imagine that I want to interrupt the move. Then I press Control C. Voila. And we can see that the motor is stopped at this position. It took some time to stop because it's decelerating. And uh, now the, the deceleration uh, time is uh, quite high. In fact, we can know it takes 2.5 seconds to uh, decelerate because I changed the settings. So voila. So this is why if it's at constant speed, if you move sufficiently uh, enough, you, you are at constant speed. And when you press Control C, it's doing a gentle abort. It, it's uh, stopping the motor and, and doing its deceleration. OK, something um, important to know when we do UMV, UMVR, MV, all the commands in Bliss, in fact, for to move motor, you can, in fact, give a list of motors, not only one. So for example, there is a SY, uh, we can go to 0 0.5, SZ, uh, we can go to 1, for example. And if I do this, um, the both motors, SY and SZ, uh, the Bliss will optimize the move, in a sense that if they are in the same, if they are from the same controller, if the controller supports the command to start motors simultaneously, and normally all motors all motor controllers have that or something like that, then we really send only one command. And if the motor controller uh, does not support it, or if the motors are from multiple controllers, then we make it in a sequence. But basically, all the commands in Bliss are always optimized to produce the best result. This is what we want, at, at, at least. <laughs> so, if, okay, if I execute that, I see that the motors are moved to the positions where I want, both at the same time. I mean, they are, they are started at the same time, and then they move depending on their acceleration and velocity. So, um, something that we can see as well is uh, when you use a bliss object, so SY is a bliss object, which is in fact a Python object. So, for those who know Python, you can do this, for example, and you see that it's a mock-up axis, uh, this motor. And, and otherwise, you have this you, when you in the shell, when you type the name of a, of a motor, in fact, if you just press enter without doing anything else, you get this, which is detailed information about uh, about the, the the object. So this is something that all all Bliss um, objects have. So for example, if I do this, I, I see that in the shell, uh, for some reason here it's uh, stripped. The, the the but okay, I just because okay, voilà. You see so this motor SX has no unit. We can give a unit, but it doesn't have one. There is this offset because we changed the dial and user position. There is no backlash. There is a sign of one, which is positive sign. This is the steps per unit. And then you see more information, in fact, uh, about the motor. We also have some internal information for us. And uh, there is an encoder, for example, on this motor. So then we can access the encoder position directly from the axis. So we can do something like that. And here we have information about the encoder itself. So, okay, so another, another um, useful thing to know is that these objects, most of the time, they, they, are, they have their own functions, or, which is called method, in fact, in terms of uh, uh, programming. 
And you can uh, do normally the same things that you can do with um, the shell commands, you can do directly on the object. But sometimes it gives you some extra, um, let's say, a finer gra grain control on the thing. So for example, instead of using MV, I can directly do SX move, and then I can put the target position directly. So for example, at the moment, I will ask, OK, where are you, SX? OK, I am at this position. So I say, OK, move to, uh, to for example, to 2,500. So now it's moving. It's exactly the same. I can achieve the same result if I, if I do like that, for example. OK, I'm sorry. But the first, this notation is object-oriented notation. And I have more control on the, on the thing. So for example, if I do it like that, I will move back to this position. I can say, or I will move to some other position. I can say weight false. If I do this, the motor will start moving, and it will get back to the prompt immediately. So then I can execute something else, and at some point I can synchronize by waiting for the end of move. So let's do that. So now the motor started, and if I look at the position, I see it moving, okay? And then I will say, uh, I can say stop. So then it's stopping with the 2.5 seconds uh, as I explained before. And I can uh, also wait for the end of the move. So now I'm going to move to something closer, like 8,000, for example. And then I will say, wait, move. And this, is, this will block until the motor finishes the move. So depending what you want to do, you have sometimes more options with the, with the object-oriented approach, or you use the, the the normal functions that are in the PS shell that are in fact similar to what we existed in spec, in fact. So it depends. So um, if I, I last thing I want to show about the motors is the state. So for example, I move back to uh, 5,000. And then I can show you the state here. So the state says, OK, axis is moving. And so I have the position here that is updated. And uh, I can, I, I will wait because it's almost uh, arrived. So I can say, wait, move, while well, it's already arrived. So now if I look, it's 5,000, OK. Um, something useful uh, on, on Beamline, sometimes when you want to align your samples, you want to, um, to be able to, it's like, for example, on the, st on the stage, you have, for example, two linear directions, uh, and you want to align something. So you can use this third TW command. Uh, it existed in spec as well. And here you can give a list of motors. So let's say uh, th those two motors. And the particularity here in Bliss is that it starts a graphical interface. So you can uh, follow, you can, um, it's there. I don't know if you see it. Okay, I have, okay, I have to share, okay, wait a minute. I have to share the, the screen, the entire screen, in fact. So when you use the TW command, you give two motors or, or more, maybe. I uh, can't remember. And here you can say, okay, the, the vertical one is, is, for example, SZ, and the horizontal one is SY. And then you give some a step, and, and you can just uh, move from, from steps. So, for example, I move like this, or like this, or like that. And so I, I, I can, at the same time, uh, I can do an acquisition. I, I won't demonstrate that now because um, it's, uh, it's for the next... Uh, Part of the tutorial, but basically you can imagine that every time you move, you are counting on the camera, and you see, for example, where you are, uh, uh, where the beam uh, goes, and where the sample is, or something like that, and you can align your sample or something like this. So, I think we have uh, questions, maybe. So it's maybe the good moment to look at those questions. So there was only one question. Hey, sorry. <laughs> okay. It was to show the list of motors. So that's either LS mod yeah. or where all that shows the motors and the positions. Exactly. Yeah, so, yes, where all, like in spec before, it shows you a user and dial for each motor. 
Okay, so this is the, let's say, the basic functionality we have on the Bliss uh, uh, motor objects. Okay. A quick question from Matteo. Uh, Can you talk again about the uh, limits, how to change the, limit. the limits? Sure. So the limits, it's a limits property. In fact, there are three properties. You, you have low limit, you can, and high limit. And you can change it's the it's a properties that are read right. So you can change, for example, I can say, uh, okay, so where am I at the moment? I'm there. Okay, I'm gonna reset the position. I'm gonna say, okay, this is zero, and then I will say, uh, okay, uh, low limit is minus one. Okay, so then if I look at limits, it will tell me minus one infinite, and so if I move uh, to uh, minus two. It doesn't want because it exceeds the low limit, and I can say, okay, move to minus uh, zero dot five or something. And in fact, the real motor position in the controller is this one, but for us, as we did a reset of the position, it's uh, this one. Okay. Okay, so basically you have a bunch of motors you can play with, <laughs> and um, voila. If there are no more questions, I will go to the to the next point uh, because after talking about motors, we're going to talk about counters. Yes, yes. To answer Alexander, yes, all the motor functions are available in the user scripts. So, for example, uh, if we take, uh, if you remember this, this is the user script we wrote before, uh, but we can, we, can, uh, we can change it to, to use any, for example, instead of, uh, uh, I will add one function, I will move stage, for example, and uh, I will uh, accept uh, two parameters. Uh, it's maybe a bit stupid, but okay, it's, uh, it's uh, the only example I can come up with now. Okay, so here I can say MV SXX SYY, and so, and I can add some, uh, some nice message, uh, moving sample stage uh, to, uh, some, I, will, I will craft a, a nice message. So this is just a Python syntax you can learn. Voila. Okay. And uh, voila. So, for example, I added this move stage commands, which which is using MV and using the objects that are already exposed in the in the session. So, what is important to notice for those who don't know programming or who don't know Python, those two x and y, they are the parameters of the function. But those two s6 and sy, they are they refer to the motors that are there that are called s6 and sy. Okay. So when I will start, when I will execute this script, I will load it again. Voila, so I'm loading it again. And so now in my EHP, I get my script, which is move stage. So voila, and I can, I can see X and Y. I'm, I, when I put the parenthesis, it's, it's uh, proposing me to, to have X and Y values, so I can say, uh, um, I, in fact, I can't exactly remember which values I can move, but okay, let's say uh, with like that. And so then we see it's moving the stage. So this this is the message from the print, and those two and those two here are the message from the MV command. But you can also use uh, directly uh, the uh, object-oriented uh, approach. And you can do it like that as well, uh, or with uh, sy move. So the big difference is that this one is better because it groups the motors. Uh, this one means it starts the first one. And in fact, here it's not even starting, it's really moving, and then it moves the other one. And if I want to, 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 to do it uh, better, I can use a motor group, but okay, this is um, beyond the tutorial today, but there is a lot to learn about moving stuff. But okay, for let's say for your scripts, I would, I would say use MV. Also, it's nice because uh, uh, you, you, we can imagine to, uh, to have uh, more features in those MV. I mean, the shell commands can have more features that, are, that exist in the library, but, are, but maybe you don't know how to, how to do it, like this uh, uh, fact that motors move uh, simultaneously. And so it's better to use the, sh if it exists, it's better to use the shell function. 
there is an extra an extra question, yes, sorry, about motor parameters and the way it is saved. Yes. Uh, yes. So in fact, when you ch when we change uh, speed and acceleration, it's really overwriting parameters on the controller level. Yes. So in fact, it's really changing uh, on the controller level. Yeah. And uh, something to know in Bliss is that um, speed and acceleration they are in uh, international units, so uh, normal units, I would say. So it's. Uh, uh, units per second and unit per second uh, power of two minus two. Okay, so let's move on with counters now. So, so together, together with scans uh, and motors, the counters they are one of the fundamental concepts of this. So the motors they are what we move. And the counters, they are what we measure. So just like motors, the counters are identified with a unique name. Um, and the name is derived from the controller. So the, the controller is the hardware behind the counter, in fact. So as we have LSMOT to show the list of motors, we also have a function to get the list of counters, which is called LSCNT. And so the counters here in this session, we have a bunch. Uh, this is what we can measure with the devices that are configured in this session at this moment. So uh, we have plenty of those. And uh, when you want to, to see uh, uh, how it works, you can use the CT command. So CT is like a CT in spec, it's counting for some time. So you, you say CT, then you, you have to put the count time. So by default it's one, but let's say 0 0.5 for example. And then you have to give the counters you want to count. So for example, I'm going to count uh, a diode I have, okay, diode one. So if I do this for 0 0.5 seconds, we will uh, count uh, the, this diode and we get the value. This is the value uh, that, that have been uh, counted for this measurement. Um, there is, a, there is a lot to say about the counters. So I think I can, I can show you the, um, the page in the documentation about counters. I'm going to show you. OK, so here I'm changing. OK. Uh, so I'm going to the documentation of Bliss. And we will move to the counter section of the tutorial. So as I said, it's an experimental parameter which can be measured during the scan. And uh, basically, what we call the controller is the clock, and the counter is the time, for example. And the counters, they all have the type, the unit, and the shape. So in Bliss, the counters, they can be, uh, there are three shapes uh, uh, that we use uh, regularly that, that, uh, that are for counters. 0D for single values, 1D for spectrum, for spectra, and 2D for images, basically. Um, so a, a controller can have uh, multiple counters, and each counter can have its own data type and uh, data shape and unit. So it's written a bit here, in fact. Uh, we can also add conversion functions, and uh, voila, we give some examples. So it's a very interesting reading if you want to, to know more about the counters. But uh, okay, we give some example of, uh, of a controller which has a temperature, pressure, uh, spectrum. So, so by default, um, yes, because there are there are three big types of counters in Bliss. So uh, there is sampling counters, integrating counters, and calculation counters. <clears throat> so the sampling counters, they are the counters that are maybe the easiest. Uh, I mean, the more, let's say, uh, I guess this is the more uh, common one. So it's uh, typically those diodes. They have a sampling mode. So it's, uh, for example, here it's mean. So it means that while, while it's uh, acquiring for the time that is specified in the CT command, it's uh, at the end, the result we get is the mean of the different values that have been sampled. So that's why it's called sampling counter. So basically it's this. It's, it's sampling values for the counting time, and at the end, we publish the mean value. And, but if you, normally as a user, you will never have to change this. Uh, 
Uh, it will always be the beamline line scientist or your local contact, or maybe you don't even care about that. But we can tune all the all the counters to be uh, even for the sampling counters to be uh, mean. So this is this mode, or we can also do an integration, or we can uh, also uh, make just one single measurement instead of making uh, different ones. Depending, we have some complicated hardware, some, so <laughs> sometimes. Uh, we can only uh, measure one, in fact, because it's slow or whatever, or it's not meaningful to have different values. Or we can also have last. So in this case, we measure everything, but we keep the last one. So we have all those different modes, and uh, the mode by default is mean. So this is for the sampling counters. Um, we also have integrating counters. So this is an example of integrating, integrating counter. So an integrating counter is, for example, if we make a region of interest uh, of a 2D detector, then we can have the standard deviation, the sum, the, the average of the pixels uh, in the region of interest, in the ROI. And so this is an integrating counter because during the acquisition, it's bound to a time master uh, and it's making the, the it's uh, making the, the acquisition while it's uh, integrating, in fact. Um, voila, yes, thanks about for the link. So you have uh, all those counters uh, in, the, in, the, in the demo session. So for example, we can uh, try to, um, to make an acquisition on, on a region of interest or something like that, but I don't want to be too fast in the, in the for example, we can use a beam position monitor. So we have a, a Tomo camera, let's say. So this yeah, is- share uh, the screen. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, let's see, so I am gonna share the screen. <laughs> a bit slow today. Voila. Okay, I'm sharing the screen again. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna use the beam viewer, okay? So the beam viewer, um, when you type beam viewer, it's a, it's a simulation beam viewer that we have in the demo session. And uh, it, it's, um, it, it has counters already. So if you want, you, we, we can see them with LSCNT. Uh, but for some reason here, my screen doesn't want to show everything. So I need to do what? Uh, OK, so I will do differently. If I do beam viewer.counters, I see the counters of the beam viewer. So basically, this beam viewer has all those counters. For example, X and Y, it's the X position and the Y position of the beam in the acquired image. So for example, I can do CT for some, for some exposure time. Uh, beam viewer uh, counters uh, X and beam viewer counters Y. And, voilà. and if I do this, I get two values, which are presumably the position of the beam in the image. And those counters, uh, they, 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 uh, they are uh, integrating counters. And the ROIs is the same. So it's more, it's more relevant with a ROI, by the way. But, OK, so for example, we have ROI1. So I can do uh, counters ROI1. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. In fact, the ROI is multiple counters. You can see that ROI1 is making a sum, an average, a standard deviation, mean, max. So in this case, they are uh, there in the counter groups. OK, and so here I, 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 I can count and get the values of this region of interest. So Valentin, afterwards, will show you how to edit the ROIs with the graphical tool and everything. But at the moment, you, I just want to demonstrate the different kinds of counters, so sampling counters, like the diode, integrating counters. At the end, it makes, for you, it makes no difference. I mean, you use one or the other. And uh, what is important to know is how it, uh, how that it exists and that you have different types. But if you are just uh, using the bliss, normally, you don't care really about those details. Um, so it's a bit painful to always have to type the full list of counters you want to count. So there is uh, something that we did. In fact, for those who know spec, before spec, when we were doing CT, it was counting on all the counters. So here we didn't do the same. We put in place something called the measurement group. So a measurement group is a group of counters. 
And um, the idea is that depending on the experiment, you have multiple measurement groups. And instead of uh, giving the name of all counters you, when you want to do a scan or when you want to count, you, you, you use the measurement group instead. So there is a default measurement group, which is uh, called the active measurement group. And in this, in this session, the, the active measurement group has all those counters. So the names that are there are the names that we can find in LSCNT, in fact. And so if I count without specifying anything, it will use the active measurement group and count on all this. So let's do that. So I'm going to remove this. So I'm just counting for some time. And it will count on the enabled counters of the active measurement group. And I get the values here. Voilà. And I can see which controller it is. Voilà. And um, in fact, you can, you can enable or disable counters in the measurement group. So for example, I'm going to disable um, all the beam viewers, for example. So I'm going to say, OK, beam viewer. And then I can use a wild card like star, for example. So it will disable all the beam viewer counters, in fact. So now if I do this, I see that they are in the disabled column. So if I count again without any other argument, it will just count on the two diodes. And I get the result here of the two diodes. And I can enable, of course, the counters back. Uh, I, can, voilà. I can use a. I can use star, and so then it will enable every uh, all the counters that were defined in the measurement group. We have multiple levels because the measurement group contains some counters, not all, and then you can enable and disable counters of this measurement group. But we can have multiple measurement groups, and uh, we can switch from one or the other to be the active one. What is important for you to know is that normally when you are doing your experiments, you just do active MG. You look at the active counters, and if you're happy, you can do your scan. And it will take this by default. If you are not happy because you want to add a disabled counter, you want to remove a counter, you can manipulate it with enable, disable. And when you do the scan again, it will take this into account normally, and you, get, uh, you will get the scan uh, values only uh, from the selected counters. And um, basically, this is the mechanism. But it's flexible because you can also count for example, you can also mix things like, for example, counting from the active measurement group and adding something like, I don't know if there is a, no, there's only two diodes, I should find something else. For example, this uh, Tomo camera thing. And then it's counting on three, on three different uh, objects. But uh, voila, basically uh, this is it. Mm. So little by little, we are moving to the scans because now that we saw motors, we saw counters, so now we are almost ready for the scan. I'm just looking if there are some questions. Uh, no, no, okay, good. So then we can continue by sharing this again. Okay. Okay, so. In this tutorial, we will only uh, talk about step-by-step -step scans. So what we call step-by-step -step scans is the scans when an axis is moved, uh, one or several axes are moved along one direction with interval, and data is acquired when the motors are stopped. Uh, then the axes are moved again, and they follow that trajectory. But uh, on beam lines, there are other kinds of scans, which involve, in fact, synchronization hardware. So um, we, we, have, we also have simulation, simulation for those scans, but uh, we didn't put it in this tutorial because it's a first, uh, let's say, a first level tutorial. But uh, uh, those, uh, synchron the, the synchronization hardware allows to do um, continuous measurements uh, during the scan. So this is called a fast scan or zap scan or fly scan, depending uh, on the institute and depending on, on the implementation. But in fact, um, those are in fact just uh, uh, moving motors and measuring at the same time while the movement is happening at constant speed, for example. And, and those are really, today at ESRF, those are, are for the blitz beam lines, they are the ones that are really used for real life experiment. But, uh, but the, the design of those scans depends on the capability of the beamline, on the, on the equipment that is installed, on the, it depends on various factors. 
So there is no generic command to do, okay, uh, I'm going to make continuous scan because what is important is correlation of the data. I mean, you want, when you want to do your continuous scan, we need synchronization hardware to ensure that, that uh, data is taken at the proper moment and everything. So those scans, we, I can't demonstrate from the demo session, but they exist on Beamlines and they have been put in place normally by the Beamline scientists and the uh, local contacts. I mean, so normally as a user, if you go to the Beamline, uh, your experiment, there is a high chance that uh, it will be on a continuous scan, in fact. But also, but in any ways, the alignment scans or other scans you may want to do, depending uh, what you want to do, in fact, can still be step-by-step -step scans. What is important to know is that all that you know for the step-by-step -step scans, they are uh, still valid for the continuous scans. I mean, the measurement groups, uh, the way it works, in fact, in this is the same if it's step-by-step -step or continuous. So what, what changes, in fact, is the way the scan code is written, but uh, not the way to use it. So uh, for the classic step-by-step -step scans that exist in this, we have uh, a page in the documentation I'm going to share. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I share everything, so I will do it again. I'm going to share this. OK, so if I go here in standard scans, so the step-by-step -step scans, this is what we call the standard scans, in fact. So we already saw CT, which is not really a scan, but mean measurement. Then there is a loop scan. So the loop scan is the same as CT, repeated n times. Then there is the time scan, which, which has an infinite number of points, and you have to interrupt it with control C when you, when you are done with it. And otherwise, the same scans as same commands as in spec. You have a scan, a two scan, and even a n scan. So those scans, in fact, they re they move one mo the, the a scan moves one motor n times and make acquisition for each point. So you have little drawing here that explains a bit uh, what it is exactly. Then you have A2 scan, so it's moving two motors, and, 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 and then you have a, N scan for any number of motors. T scan, they are the relative flavors of the A scan. So we also have D2 scan, D3 scan, D4 scan, DN scan, okay? What is interesting is the mesh. So A mesh is an absolute position mesh, or D mesh, the relative position mesh. So in this case, it's moving two motors, and it makes like a grid. So, um, so for example, it's moving, uh, the, uh, the first one is moved on the first line, then it's moving the other motor, then it's making another line, it's moving the motor like a grid. We also have the point scan. So the point scan, in fact, it's uh, to move one motor to define positions that are not uh, following a linear trajectory. And the lookup scan, which is the more versatile one, you give yourself the list of motors and the list of coordinates and and it will uh, go uh, at each uh, position for each uh, coordinate so basically this is all for the standard scans and uh, we have uh, we have some other scans uh, that you will discover on the beam lines but basically then how to start the scans it's always the same you give the scan parameters you give eventually uh, the, control, the controllers, the counters, the measurement group, or nothing. In this case, it will take the active measurement group, and you can see the scan going on. So I will show you that in the terminal. OK, so I'm back here. So I have, um, for example, if I do this one. OK, this one I can move at any position. So I'm going to do A scan. So absolute position of S6, I will start at um, zero. I will go to uh, 10. I will uh, have, I don't know, 20 intervals and the count time uh, zero at one. Or again, I, I will make it, well, I will make it uh, zero at three just to, to take it, for it to take a bit more time. And then I will uh, specify diode one. So I will, I will get only the values of dial 1 uh, with the motor A6 going from 0 to 10, and, and voila, we will see the scan. So we can see the scan is running. But contrary to spec, you don't see the value, you don't see the data. So you might ask yourself, where is the data? Can I see it? So in this case, you press F5, and you see 
the scan values. So here, here are the values of the scan with the F5 uh, key. So we can see the time, the timer. We can see the motor positions. We can see uh, the diode one, which is what we measure. And there is an extra thing is that as the SX motor as an encoder, automatically we put the encoder positions. Voilà. And when I want to go back to normal B shell, I press F5 again. So then I, I'm back here. Um, we didn't talk about that yet because this is the out part, but when you execute the scan, it's uh, saving the data by default. But we can say save false. In this case, the data is not saved. Uh, the scan is still performed. I can press F5 and see it while it's uh, going on. But uh, this is not saved, in fact. And for the saving part, just wait a bit and you will get the uh, old information. <laughs> but today, uh, let's ignore that for the moment. OK? So this is how we start the scan. And of course, I can, I can do it without specifying any, anything. In this case, it will take the active measurement group so now, at the moment, the active measurement group is all those things. So when I execute my scan, I will get much more stuff with F5, OK? OK, so it's doing it. And then I see all the values. It's even a bit difficult to read because there is a line wrapping. But then you will see, uh, Valentin will show you data visualization, and you will get uh, better, much better things, OK? So this is it. So I would say, um, are there questions? Uh, I see that what I propose is that maybe uh, we, we can make, a, let's say, a little break so for Valentin to, to prepare himself. Uh, and meanwhile, I can answer questions if you want. And uh, let's say, OK, uh, it, it's, let's say, um, OK, a 10 minute break. So at minus five, we continue uh, with the, the next part of the talk, OK? And, um, and so meanwhile, we are here to answer your questions. Uh, is it OK? Uh, ah, you had a different effect on the simulator. Uh, yeah, because of it's a uh, ah, yes. Yeah, in fact, we opened the. Uh, um, because it's a web page, so ah. it's open it. I don't know what uh, something on the web. Ah, okay, I'm really uh, sorry. Uh, back, uh, oh, what is doing? <laughs> okay, something I'm really sorry okay. for that, but it's true that it's uh, this new platform is on the web and and uh, ah, now it's working. Ah, okay. I don't know how. Okay, let's see. And if I say F, yeah, now it's working. Well, Okay. Good. Okay. So we we make this five minute, let's say, uh, no, ten minute break. In fact, and, and uh, meanwhile, you, we we stay here. We we can answer questions like like before. Okay. So for you to maybe try a bit different scans, or I don't know, if you want to experiment a bit. So don't worry. Uh, don't no, don't hesitate to put safe force to not fill the disk with data. <laughs> In the, yeah. So now we will talk about uh, about Flint, which is uh, our um, our graphic user interface, which was mostly displayed to uh, designed to, to display data, live data. Uh, I will share my, my screen first. I will try to share. Uh, so first, uh, you can launch this application by typing Flint, and here we are. But there is also another way to, to do it. Basically, if um, your scan uh, contains data which have to, to be displayed with, uh, with a Flint, uh, basically an image, uh, Flint will be launched uh, automatically for you if you request it. For that, there is, um, there is uh, this, uh, this, uh, this structure, uh, data display, and auto. You can switch it to true, and in this case, I can do, for example, a CT on the beam viewer, as you saw before. And the, this will first request Flint, and then do the CT and display the result. OK. OK. 
I would like to I would have to, to juggle with uh, with, with screens and, and traditional ones. Okay, so flints who provide a few different things. Uh, mostly, mostly I will show you uh, first what you can do with, with counters and, and scans, really simple scans with with diodes. For that, I will follow um, a tutorial which is based on the um, on the on the slit, which is this one. We we'll copy it on the chat. Can I? So I will use uh, this um, this device to, to show some picture for, from from print. Well, first, what uh, what is uh, what is uh, what is a, what is a slit? It's basically uh, four four different uh, motors. I try to okay, what is that? So that's uh, there is two different uh, uh, blades uh, connected to together. So you have these motors and uh, connected together to to provide a virtual motor which. Um, Represent the gap of the slit and the offset of the slit. So the position of the slit and the way to, to play with it. Uh, first, with such a, such a device, you have to align it, and we can use frame for that. Uh, we saw here the, 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 the beam and the blade are two different uh, devices which will. Uh, Can you say uh, obfuscate the the position of the beam itself? So we will we will cut the beam at the place the, um, these motors will, will be. So first, well, what we have to do is to is to move the motor outside. So here we move outside the, the top blade and the bottom blade. We can do a CT to check if the if the beam is fully displayed. That's the case. Uh, now we can scan. Uh, for example, we want to align the top blade to, to the beam. What we request here is to it is to scan this top this motor from. Uh, from these two values, uh, using using uh, 20 uh, intervals, and with uh, with the binula. And as you saw before with Matthias, the binula was set up with uh, some rows, so we can use this rows into another another place of uh, print, which is here the curve the curve display. Uh, this scan is displayed here, so that's the properties. This screen is the properties of, uh, of this window because we have selected it, and we can tune what we want to display. Here we see we saw that uh, we can see that uh, the slip top is selected as the x axis, which is displayed uh, in this part of the, of, of, the, um, of the plot, and it is also displayed as uh, as the y, so it is. Pointless, basically, but we can, for example, remove it here and display the sum from the ROI. And now we have something interesting. What we saw is an integration of all the pixels of the camera. And uh, so, what we want to, to, to do to achieve is to, is to move the, um, the blade in the middle of the other beam. So, here. For that, we have so some. We have some helper from uh, from from this. So we do send, for example. Uh, let me let me remember. So that's a, that's a small helper who display the position of of this cell. So what I have requested here 
is to, to find the, um, the center of uh, this can using this, uh, this specific diode. Now what I want to do is to move the motor at, at this location. So same thing, we have a go-to send. So as we do, the last scan we do was, uh, was done on a specific motor. It is, uh, it is used to, to, to move by default. That's done. And what we can see in, uh, in Flint now is the, the same position is the same as the current position of the motor. So it means the, the slit is, is at the right location. And now we want to, to use this position as a reference. So as we saw uh, previously, slip top, yes, slip top. Position, position equals zero, and that's our new location. Same for the bottom, for the bottom blade. I will just copy past the the recipe. Basically, you can you also can do it without looking at it. That's the exact same thing as before. So uh, a scan of the bottom, uh, move the, the blade outside, uh, scan the, the bottom slit, uh, find the location of the middle of the, the integration diode, and move this position, uh, move the, the blade at this position, and uh, use it as a reference. Finally, we can align the, the slits themselves. So we also copy past the, the result. Of, uh, the recipe. Basically, basically, what we want to do is the same for the gap and the, and the offset. <coughs> On Flint, uh, so as you saw. Uh, the beam viewer is there. There is also the curve, the curve, uh, the curve plot. We there is some 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 tools to play with the layout. Basically, you probably want to display both at the same time. So here you can click here, and uh, then it splits all the, the kind of the plots and, and, and move them together. So now we have uh, the, the the zero D scans here and uh, the beam viewer. We can we can we can set up the reference of the, of the slip. So from that, um, okay. I, I did it once. Yeah. Uh, so what it, it does is basically uh, this two this, this two play at this location zero is now uh, equal to a gap of zero. So he set uh, he set up this um, he set up this uh, this position to zero, and then scan the offset to find the, the peak, um, and go to this position uh, as a reference to, to the offset. I think something is wrong here. Yeah. Oh no, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Okay. So. so here we have the, the result, the, the last scan. Uh, which was basically we open a little the gap and we were able to to scan all the position of this slit to, to find a kind of peak. Now we can use this device to to display all the feature of, of Flint. So I have presented uh, basically what we can do here by selecting um, our steps. There is also uh, the one Y axis here, which is the one here, but there is also another one here on this side. So we could uh, we could display at the same time other informations. Uh, obviously, uh, but it's, it's really overlap here. I will do something else. So we see the two together, for example, with two different axes. Uh, we can display many uh, different information at the same time. Um, Another feature is in case you want to compare uh, values from different scans. 
this is not possible here, but uh, here you have a tool that you can enable to, to achieve this thing. So here what I say is I want to at, uh, at most five scans, and I will uh, scan this um, display, uh, this, this lid, to, to display different scans. I have uh, a small script here. So that's a Python loop. Um, it will iterate this, uh, this small, uh, these two lines uh, with uh, five different values. Uh, I call it gap, and I use it to move the gap, uh, the, the gap of the slit, and then uh, scan the, the offset of the, of the slit between these two positions and, uh, and, and do a CT of uh, 0.1 second of everything uh, defined, defined inside the, the building. So that's our, our first scan, which, uh, which use a really uh, huge, scan, uh, huge gap. And then we reduce the amount of, uh, of, uh, of the gap. At the same time, uh, Flint also provide here maybe we can we can remove the, this thing or what we can display. Uh, at the same time, Flint also provides to you a few other features, like for example, I will remove that, that thing, select this uh, this curve, and I can ask to uh, display uh, to to fit a Gaussian on top of that. So for each different scans, a Gaussian will, will be uh, computed. And, uh, and you can have uh, some parameters if you, if, you, if you take a look at the or not. Anyway, yes, that's a bit tricky. But there is all the information. So there is also here a few computations you can do on, on live on, uh, on Flint side. On, Close this one. Okay. Yes, there is also an history. So we have a short period of time for, for the, the scan and the scan data. But for example, here I have removed, removed the, the free last scan I have, have done, but it is still on the history. So, so here we have a tool to reach them back. So I really forget about everything the name and the ID, but uh, you can pick something. Probably one of the which was already there. So it took a lot, but okay. Let's say we are really happy with the result here. Maybe there is something interesting to see or what. Uh, Flint also provides to you a few tools to to play with uh, with axis, for example, if you want to switch to low scale or what. Um, but also some markers. For, so, for example, we can we can put something here. I don't know what's really point, pointless. But, uh, I thought there was something more interesting than that. Uh, there is few things to have uh, to to have some information on the scans. And finally, a way to, to save the result, this uh, screenshot into the notebook, which will be presented to by by Vault in a few minutes. So I can I can click there, and it should be saved into uh, together with uh, with your notebook. Okay, that's fair enough. That's one of the kind of data Flint is able to, to display. There is other things like, uh, for example, the type data for, from MCA, which are spectrums, and also images from uh, at the SRF. We use LIMA, that's our main uh, detector. So, here I just uh, passed a few things to, to set up uh, our simulator for MCA. 
And then we can uh, we can uh, we can do a CT, a long uh, long CT, let's say, onto onto all the different kind of uh, of data we have. So two MCA uh, and three different uh, Lima camera sim simulated cameras to display uh, an image from uh, full filter mode and diffraction. And now Flynn displays those instance. So there is much, much more uh, widget now. Um, what, what it is also provided in the layout here is a way to, to, to arrange yourself all these, these tools, all these, uh, these widgets, so I can take the MCA and move it outside. I have unfortunately a really small screen here, so, but I will try to, to play with. We can move the, the widget outside here, and do the same for the images. Basically, everything can, can move outside or inside, and you also can stack the stuff together here to, to have more space, etc. Finally, for, for, for us, I will just uh, stack everything together to a bigger image. And stop this scan. So what I want to show here to you is uh, there is a, a dedicated widget for, for spectrum. You can hide uh, or display a different spectrum from the from the this the scan we have done here. It could help you to, to select what you want or what. Uh, there is a where is my Ah, yes, I was searching for the, the image with the demo to this scan. Well, for images, it's the, it's the same. Here it's a full field demo image, as I said. So you have a few options here to play with the color map. Well, basically, you can select the, the colors, you can select the, the way to normalize the, the pixels. Here we have you have a short, short histogram to play with the with uh, the position of, of the mean and max and on, and on another scale and in, uh, in full filter mode usually what you want to, to do is an automatic scale uh, using a standard deviation and in this case you can achieve um, a good result uh, which will be automatically adapted to the, to the intensity of, of the scan or such a thing. There is all, all the different things like linear or uh, arc scene and also gamma correction if you if you want to play with such a, such a thing. And for diff diffraction, uh, it's basically the same, but you probably you probably will replay with other other uh, instead of linear, you will probably use a logarithmic uh, scale. So you have something better here. And finally, with the really really noisy images. Uh, we can achieve uh, an even better, even better result with uh, with uh, some filters. So uh, let's say we have selected the logarithm scale here, and here you have uh, and here we have extra filters. Then you can load the mask. For example, what we saw in uh, in uh, in yellow is mask, but uh, we can mask it in the application itself to be able to, to have better um, autoscapes. So I'm about to find the, the data and the mask. I open them. What we, we see here is a, is a mask applied, which is highlighted, but you also can, uh, can hide it. So now what we have here is just, is just the value, but still there is nothing really, uh, really easy to see. So there is an extra, an extra filter here. Basically, by default, the Flint is set up to, to display fastly images. So 
So what we can switch from, we can switch this filter to use, uh, to, use uh, to use another filters. Basically, here we have a really huge image of uh, 2,000 uh, pixel by 2,000, and there is much more uh, much more pixel in your data curve than, than you have in in, uh, in in the screen. So this this filter allow to uh, to to uh, to 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 reach to 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 select or to display. Uh, Oh, that's difficult to explain. Uh, <coughs> let's say, let's say uh, at this at this place or this little little pixel. In fact, in your detector, it's uh, it's about a square of uh, two 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 hundred by two hundred, and so there is a sum on that or a filter, and it will display the the result of of this, of this filter. So here we are about to, to display really small things in, in the detector, which was not uh, possible before. Okay, at the same time, if you display the, the mask, you are about to you are able to to to, to, to show the uh, every place of the mask without any problem. Anyway, the mask in here, if you look at it, it's just one pixel width. Okay, and uh, at the same time, there is also the same tool as, as before. So, um, so some markers here that we can put, and uh, extra stuff like uh, a way to uh, to see some profile. So I want to display. I want to have um, a cut of the image at this place, and here is the result. So we can also save the result, uh, this result, inside the notebook, and that's basically all for for this kind of, uh, of data. Finally, I just want to, to show you that uh, it was here. It was only about a live scan, so the scan um, displaying a live scan from from print. But if you need tool to display data, we have uh, we have uh, computed. On this side uh, by yourself, uh, Flint also can be used for that. So here I have a, a small script who, who compute a, a Mandelbrot, uh, yes, which is a which is a fractal. So ah, So what I do, I request this function to generate to me uh, an image of this size, and I use this data with uh, a special uh, API provided by Bliss, and that's it. Basically, you will have the result, and you can reach inside and uh, if it's useful for you. With an extra tool here, which is um, a side histogram, which can be disabled or uh, if you need this one. And that's uh, that's all, uh, all for me. Ah yes, ah, yeah, there is an extra thing. Sorry, I forget about the mesh. So uh, so there is an extra type uh, scan type, which is a mesh mesh scan. Here I just set up uh, the motors to to have much more noise on the encoders. And what uh, what this provide is a way to scan uh, two different axes at um, two different axes. So here you have the x y and x z, and there is a fast and a slow axis. For so the fast axis will uh, will do. Uh, this amount of uh, inter, uh, inter uh, right. so much? Sorry? intervals. Intervals, yeah. Right. And for each intervals, the this scan, uh, this motor will be scanned all the this position, all, all these inter intervals. So the, the ROI will be uh, will be uh, triggered uh, these intervals by these intervals to create a kind of image. 
that's what we will so here. Yeah. Oops. Yes. So it's about to scan. So you have one axis here and the second one here. Uh, what we can so see on the, on the properties here is that these two motors are selected and one of the fluo scan is selected because it was part of the, of the scan here. But we also can uh, scan all of the things, obviously. Uh, and instead of the motors, which are the um, theoretical position of the motors, you can also use uh, the encoders. And in this case, as you see, there is a kind of noise. But you also, it could help you to, to debug a scan or to see something else from the scan. That's a very, that's a dedicated view for, for, for scatters, for machines. But you also have the, the same uh, uh, color map, color, color, um, color let, uh, tool here. And that's all for, for me. You can also say this in English. Um, if you have questions, uh, let, let us know. Else about, we continue with the data, data policy. And the acquisition faster share. So are there questions about uh, data visualization? So Valentin showed us a lot of things. Uh, maybe it was a bit fast, but uh, you can find uh, maybe um, the slits alignment uh, procedure, I mean, the exercise of aligning the slits is in the documentation. And also, you have examples of scans at the top of the demo session. It's written exam uh, scans that you can run. So normally, if you run those, you, 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 you have more or less uh, not everything, but um, some quite a big part of what Valentin presented just now. And uh, I have just passed uh, a link to the, to the documentation. Oh, so we don't really know how it behaves on the virtual machines. I hope it's okay. <laughs> but uh, well, if you want to give a try, uh, you can always. Well, if there are no questions, we will um, we will uh, move to uh, Vout's uh, part ab uh, about um, data data management in Bliss in general. But uh, voila, I don't know Vout. Do you want to take over? Yes, I can take over. Okay, so. My name is Vartanov. I'm part of the data analysis unit at TSRF, and I will talk about the directories and files that are created when when you're performing your scans. I'm, I'm sure you all tried and, and saw some data on disk. I will disc, uh, discuss what the logic is of the directory structure that's being created and what you can expect to find in the files. Uh, and then at the end, I will also discuss about the electronic logbook and how to access your data through the web, through the data portal. So I'll first start with the uh, five or six slides, uh, and then I'll go to the demo session. So if you're at the Rev and you know your proposal name and the beamline you're at, then you can always find your data in the same location. So this is under data, visitor, then the proposal name and the beamline name. So in this directory, you will find all the data that you collect during your experiment. And underneath, Blitz will create four levels of directories. So it goes four levels deep. And all the files that you find in, in there are all HDFI files. So I'll go through each of these uh, levels and discuss what they actually contain. So the first level is the proposal level. In this directory, you will only find one file, uh, which gives you a single access point to all the data of your experiment. So if you open this one file, you don't have to open anything else. You can access all the data and metadata and parameters that uh, are related to your experiment. 
uh, one directory uh, subdirectories of the of the proposal you will have a subdirectory for each uh, what's called a collection so for the purpose of this um, demonstration i'm going to assume that data collections are going to be samples so you will have one directory for each sample but it could be anything else. It could be, let's say, a temperature, an experimental condition, maybe a sample holder. But for, for, for our purpose here, I'm going to assume that you uh, collect data and group them, uh, collect that data, uh, group that data per sample. So under the proposal directory, you have one file and a number of directories equal to the number of samples you have. And then uh, one uh, uh, subdirectories of those are the data set directories, and these contain the actual data. So the files that are on the proposal and the collection level actually only contain links. These are uh, present there for your convenience if you want to have a single access point, for example, for all the data from your carb cadmium carbonate sample. So these data sets contain all your data except for images. So images are saved on the lowest level. So in the demo session, I will go through that and, and, and I'll explain that more in detail, but this gives you a general overview of, of your directory structure. So from all this, uh, what can you actually change? There are just two commands in Bliss that you can use. There's the new sample command or new collection if your collections and samples are mean something different, but again here, we assume that our data collections are samples. You have the new sample command and you can give it a string. This will be the name of the directory and also the name of the file. And then for the data sets, by default, you don't have to give them a name. You can use the command new data set without any parameter and they will be numbered one, two, three, and so on. But you can also give those names. So these are the only two things um, you have to or you can uh, do to change your directory. So you can't really change anything of the entire structure, just uh, the names. So if we look inside of one of these dataset files, uh, you will recognize these descriptions here. These are your scans. So if you have been uh, running scans in your, um, in your virtual machine, they have all been saved in a single file and appended like this, and the numbering keeps going up until you switch to a different data set or a different sample. Then if you go and have a look inside of the data of one sample, you have three types of data. So internal data, external data, and what I call here parameters and settings or metadata if you want. Uh, so the internal data is the data that's actually physically in the file. Uh, remember uh, what I said before, these files could don't contain actual data, they just contain links to where the actual data is. So that's the internal data I'm talking about. Uh, that's for all, uh, most, that's for most data, so diodes, uh, spectra, and so on, except for images. As I said, those are saved in separate directories. Um, uh, and apart from data, you also have these parameters. I will look a bit more, I will show you a bit more in detail with the demo session what those parameters can be. Could be, for example, pixel size, sample detector distance, uh, description of your sample, and so on. Okay, so let's uh, go to the demo session and demonstrate this. So the first thing you probably want to do if you arrive at the B line is understand if, I, if I'm going to do a scan here, where is this data going to end up, right? So what you do to, to know what the current directory is where data is being saved, you use uh, the scan saving object. So it's capital scan underscore capital saving. So this is an object, like uh, motors are objects and counters are objects. So this is another object. If you print it, it will give you some information about your about saving in general. So there's a lot of information here, but what's most important for you are these, um, these three lines here. So you see that if I'm scanning now, my data will be saved in this file. And if I don't use the new sample or new data set uh, command, they will be the, you will keep adding data to that one file. Then here I will show you this later. These are two links which you can open in the web browser. 
uh, to uh, the electronic logbook and also the data portal. So these files can be accessed and visualized and downloaded through the web. And um, we will uh, look at that later. So, um, so let's look at the directory structure here with, let's say, uh, your file manager uh, of your computer. So the root directory, as I said before, is data visitor and then the name of the proposal and the beam line. Uh, here it's a bit different because we don't actually have a, a, a real proposal. So don't, don't really mention, just assume that this is the top level uh, proposal directory. And as I said, there's only one file here. If you open that, you can have access to all the data of your proposal. And then for each sample or collection, you will have a folder. If you go into that folder, you see again the same thing. You have only one file, which provides a single access point to all the data from, in this case, sample A. And then one directory per data set. If you go a level deeper, you have the, the, this is the data set file, which contains the actual data, except for the images, which are down here. So let's uh, let's uh, open uh, start opening these files. So there are different ways. You can either do it uh, just from the from the command line from the, from the terminal or from Bliss. So let's start uh, opening a file from Bliss, and we're going to open just the current file, so the file that's currently being being used to save data. And for that, you can use the the command silex underscore view. Right lowercase with an underscore in between, enter. This will open uh, an application that looks a little bit like Flint, uh, except that now it's not looking at live data, it's looking at data of that has been saved already. So you have the plotting area here on the right and you can browse the directory here on the left. So here you see the data of your scans. And so let's now have a closer look at what's in here or what you can expect to, to have in here. This depends a bit on beam lines, but there are some things that are general, so I will go over those. So two uh, folders or subgroups you will have in this HFI file for each scan are the instrument and measurement group. So the measurement group gives you a flat list of all the data that's been collected in this scan. So in this case, we have a mesh scan here, uh, 15 times five. So you have 75 uh, data points and you will have 75 spectra, for example, which if you double click on it, you can browse it here. Or if you have a diffraction camera, 75 images, you can browse to them. Uh, take into account these images are not actually physically in the file. So if you copy this data to somewhere else, also make sure to copy the, the files that contain the actual images. Right? And then you have the, the diodes. So that's those are the ZRD detectors, uh, the lifetime of an MCA and so on. So this is what you also have here is the, in this case we used, I'm looking at the data of a mesh scan. So we have two motors that were moving and you will also see the motor positions in here and the encoder positions. As you can see, the motor position that you you told Bliss to move is kind of regular, while the real motor position is it's a readout from the motor, it's an encoder, so it read it reads for every point what the real position was. So what's in the measurement group here is are actually all links to what's in the instrument group. So here under the link, you see that this is called this is a soft link. And in the instrument group, you have not just the data, but also all the metadata that's associated to your detectors. So most of the elements here are detectors. Uh, you have some positioners and some special objects like slits. So let's look at a 2D detector, the diffraction camera, for example. Again, here you have the data. So again, you can browse through these images here. But you have additional parameters. For example, here you see the pixel size uh, and other parameters like the acquisition mode, uh, the camera settings and so on. Um, for an MCA, for example, you have the spectra. 
like that. And you have additional um, counters which are asserted to the dead time, for example. So this MCA was measuring apparently at an average dead time of around 30%. So for each point, you have additional things for solving the lifetime and so on. Uh, so that's detectors. Then um, you have uh, a number of groups which have to do with positioners. So here you can find all the motor positions of all your motors at the beginning and the end of the scan. Position start end, so a single value for each. If you look at positioners here, you have the start position for each of them, except for the motors that were moving, uh, which they they have the actual uh, the actual motor position during the scan here. So that's detectors and positioners. Then you also have uh, special objects like transfocators or slits. So also attenuators, for example, if you have a, 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 an attenuator in the beam, it will tell you what, what material the, the film was made of, what the thickness is and so on. So in short, this contains all the information you would need to process your data. So that's instrument and measurement. What you have in addition, um, or you may have, or sometimes not, is a, a default plot. So this is the plot when you open this file, uh, and I uh, double click here on the scan. This is the plot I see. So the BNI scientist will set this up for you. For example, if you do spectroscopy or diffraction, there's always a, a good default signal that you probably want to look at. and, and um, then you will have this plot select this this uh, NX data group in here. And typically you also have some information about your sample. So sample name, sample description, you can add other things like the formula space group and so on. Um, so that's the structure inside. So this is one data set file. So let's open one of the other files. Actually, I'm gonna now open it, uh, let's say from the, oh, from the command line here. So here I have my directory structure. I use three. You'll see here that this is the structure here as I showed you in the file manager. So for example, I can use Silex view also from the command line, at least uh, at the, if this is installed on your computer, this is not the case I think in the virtual computers. Uh, so in this case, I opened the file at the top level, the, the proposal level. So this basically contains all the data from your experiment. So we have sample A, you have sample B, you have all the data sets of sample B, one, two, three, and then you have all the scans of sample B, right? Um, if I only want to look at, I'm only interested for now in looking at sample A, I can open this file here. So now I'm going to use, of course, Silex view allows you to just look at things, right? And not really process, but if you want to process things, it's going to be dependent on which technique you use. For example, if you use fluorescence or spectroscopy, you might use a software called PyMCA. Some of you might be familiar. It works typically the same as Silex view, only it's a different uh, software. So here you see your scans. You can select the things to plot. And then you can do actual data processing. Uh, uh, so th this is out of the scope of, the, of this tutorial, but this, this PIMCA you would use for fluorescence spectroscopy. For diffraction, you would use uh, Dioptas, for example. So the BMI scientist will explain you which tool uh, to you, you can use to process data, but at least Silex view is like a generic uh, viewer. So the new sample and new dataset command. So suppose um, I'm going to switch to a new sample. Let's call this hematite. Uh -huh. It also says, okay, this is the new directory where data is going to be saved. Uh, if you see that the data set is called uh, number one here, if you want to give the data set a specific name and not just numbers, you have the new data set command. You can say, for example, we only have Kelvin, I don't know. So if you now go into scan saving, you will see that this is the, 
the file and the directory in which data is going to be saved. So now if I, if you do any scan like this, uh, you'll see, um, by the way, you will saw, you saw before that this directory does not exist here as, a, as, it's, um, as it says here. If I now look at scan saving, the directory does exist. So which does which means that basically um, as long as you don't collect data, you can still change your sample name. So if you've been if we've been using a let's use a different uh, sample name here, right? Let's suppose I, I made a typo, okay. So now I think oh this is it's good right? I spelled it wrong. Voila. It's no problem as long as you're not scanning. Uh, nothing will be created. Um, so you can always add more data sets to, um, to a sample that already exists. For example, I can go back to sample A. And you will see that the default data set here is number four because sample A already had three data sets. You cannot, however, do that um, with data sets. So once the data set is closed, you can't add more scans to it. So for example, if I want to go back to hematite, uh, I'm not sure I did a scan in there, but let's, let's do a scan in here. Okay. And suppose I'm switching to another data set or another sample, voila. Now I think ah, I I want I would like to add something to this previous data set. Can you do that? No. You can, for example, try to switch to that data set number one, and it will it will not actually let you do that, right? So when whenever a data set is closed, you can't add more scans to it. Of course, you can add still more data sets to different samples. Um, okay, so then the last part I want to show you, I don't know, are there, uh, the, the last part is the logbook and the data portal. So maybe I'll stop a bit for questions, if there are questions. Not yes, Val, there is one question from Alexander. So Alexander Fiolus, so is it possible to move data to another sample after it is already measured no. when forgetting to do new sample before a scan, for no. example? That's not possible. possible. Whenever you, you collect data and the data set is closed, it's actually sent to the data portal. So it's registered and of course you can physically move it on disk, but in the data portal it will still be uh, what it was, yes. So you can't do first loop scan and then afterwards say, ah, this was done in the wrong uh, data set. This cannot be changed anymore. So now if I do new whatever, this data is not gonna move anymore. Yeah. Okay, so then let's maybe look at the electronic logbook and the data portal. Um, so if you use the in the in your virtual machines, this will be disabled because you won't you don't actually have an official uh, proposal. So I'm just going to show it here. So if you on your keyboard, you can use the control key, and then you use the mouse left button to click. It will open um, your electronic logbook in a, in a web browser. So before Valentin was showing uh, Flint and at some point he was saying, okay, I'm gonna send this image to the electronic logbook. So these are the images uh, that were sent. So what's uh, a brief introduction of what you see here by default. So by default, Bliss is recording everything or, or sending everything or logging everything you type on the command line. So you see here the mesh cam, you see here, um, Let's say, yeah, everything, everything you type on the command line, basically. That will be there by default. If you don't want to see it, you can go in settings and, and disable that. 
uh, information uh, gives you uh, additional information like uh, when a data set name changed or a sample name changed and so on. Uh, and then you have the comments and these are the comments that you as the user have added. So for example, through Flint, by click by, by sending the image to the electronic logbook, you can create through the web portal here a new a new comment just like that. You can save it and then it will be here. You can always edit it later if you want to change it, change it. You want to maybe do some formatting. You can also insert images. I don't know why this doesn't want to move. Uh, okay. Uh, my, oh. uh, you can insert images, tables, and so on. Uh, you can also send information from, from from the command line here. So for example, you have the commands elog something. So you have elog add, elog plot, and elog print. So elog print allows you to send uh, some message from the command line. And then if you look in the electronic logbook, you will see that message here. You can also modify it like that. Uh, so basically that's kind of the same as print. So you can use it in the same way as print, except that elog print sends it not prints it like here on the command line, but it prints it to the logbook. Then you have elog plot, which basically does the same as clicking this button here. So I have a plot here in Flint. If I use elog plot, this is, for example, useful if you have a macro in the night, right? So you're doing a lot of scans and you want to have Flint open. And then after every scan, you use the command elog plot, and then you will have um, the image from Flint. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not there. Okay. I'm not sure why I don't see it here. And then maybe, yeah. Let me try one more time. Could be that. Okay, let's see if this goes. Maybe I've, I, uh, okay, I don't know. Maybe I didn't set up the right Flint. It's uh, in my local session here. Okay, never mind. So this is how you send messages or text or plots or images then the last thing is elog add so suppose you have a command like where all where all motors and you want to copy paste it to the logbook of course you can select this and then go to the web browser and copy paste it but you also have the the, the command sorry elog add which basically adds the output of the last uh, command to the logbook like this Okay, so then um, to uh, finally, so that's the electronic logbook. So finally, let's look at the data, which is on disk here. Let's look at it through the web, uh, through the data portal. So that's the second link here, control click. Uh, well, you can also just uh, move it like that here. Um, this gives you let's say all the data sets you have collected so for example uh, i don't know let's say sample b you will have inf information about uh, your sample you will have some metadata about whatever the beamline deemed to be useful as metadata and you have the data files here so remember each data set contains let's say one file and then additional files which contain the images right so you can do two things here. You can either download things. So then you just download it uh, to your local uh, file system, or you can view it like this. So uh, you can do the same with, with the images. So this will show you by default, the default plot, if there is any, but you can also click on open viewer to browse the entire file. Again, 
through the web. So the data is not on your local disk, it's in the portal. So you can browse it like that. And you can look at these scans. For example, this is a mesh scan where the default plot was diet one. But you can here, you recognize the measurement group and the instrument group. So this is basically the HDFI file, but then just um, display it, or, or you can browse it and plot it like with Select View or PyMCA um, from, a, from, a, from a web browser. Voila, uh, I think, um, yes, let me see whether I didn't skip anything, yes. That's uh, that's all I wanted to talk about as an introduction to data logbook data portal. So if there are any questions, otherwise I give the floor back to Matthias. Yes. So I think it was a lot of information for everybody. So uh, okay, uh, maybe uh, maybe you are still thinking about all this, digesting all this information. Um, so Alexander is asking if the data will get a DOI and become publicly available after three years. So will the logbook also be part of this? Uh, yes, the logbook will also be. This will also become uh, available. Yes. Okay, so we are we have uh, six minutes left for this session, so it's the moment to to ask your last minute questions or to talk about. Um, I mean, if you want a general comment or anything, don't hesitate. Um, in the chat, I'm writing my email. So if you have questions about uh, about Bliss, you don't hesitate to send a mail. I will uh, pass it to the to the required person, uh, if I can't answer myself or voila. I hope that you like this uh, tutorial and the virtual machines. And in any ways, I think we can meet uh, at any time at TSRF next time you come. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so it's very nice. All those things, it goes straight, straight to our house. Thanks. <laughs> okay, see you all then. I think we can finish this session. Uh, yeah, if I can stay a bit more, if people are still using the touch machines, yeah. trying to okay. just stay a couple of minutes if, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Or. Yeah, we, we can all we can we can stay a bit uh, in any ways. Yeah. So thanks to all for your participation. <laughs>